First and foremost, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers today. So, uh, Professor Diana Lockwood, you've joined us today. You're with the uh, London School, you were, you work, you're Professor Emeritus at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. You're also the founder of the New Face for Leprosy project. So, welcome, Diana. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here and I'm looking forward to participating in this session. Well, we're very pleased to have you here and uh, Professor Lockwood, you've been working quite closely with Tom Bradley, who is a photographer and artist and also working on the New Face for Leprosy project. So hi, Tom, and welcome. Hi there. Thank you. Hi. Um, we're not jealous at all, but Lara is uh, tuning in from South Africa. So, Lara Utian Preston, hi. Hello. Thanks for joining us today. Um, uh, Lara, you are the co founder and the CEO of the Ladima Foundation. And uh, hi. Hello, hi, everyone. And your foundation is working to enhance and highlight uh, the role and the position of women as filmmakers and content providers. So we'll be hearing more about that um, during the discussions. And also a big hello to John Ferguson. Hi, John. Hello, nice to meet you. Hi. Nice to have you here. And John, you are a photographer as well and a visual storyteller and um, your body of work spans a huge amount of uh, very varied and numerous projects. So we'll be uh, also hearing more about that from you. Um, so here at the ISNTD, of course, we're very concerned and we focus uh, a lot on neglected tropical diseases as defined by the official list at the WHO, but also in a much broader sense, um, neglected diseases, but also neglected communities. And when it comes to photography and creative content, neglected communities can kind of take on a very wide definition, but um, the approaches and the lesson learned across all of them can really be useful um, and can be shared across quite a lot. So this is why today we'll be hearing uh, from quite a wide range of approaches. Um, first and foremost, though, we'd like to focus on the New Face for Leprosy project as a clear example um, of a neglected tropical disease kind of collaboration with the creative industry um, to change the narrative, the imagery, and fundamentally the um, experience of the affected persons. And your project, Diana and Tom, um, of course, as the name indicates, focuses on leprosy. And we'd love to hear a bit more about how this came about um, and what your plans are. Um, I'll hand over first to Professor Diana Lockwood, um, well, Diana, you don't really need an introduction, but you know, for those who perhaps aren't in the field of neglected tropical diseases, it's worth mentioning you've been working for more than three decades in the field of leprosy, um, and this based in the UK, but also um, in a huge amount of research centers across the world. Um, you've uh, had a very collaborative approach um, from the onset. You've always been very concerned with the people affected by leprosy and also in, in breeding collaboration between other um, researchers and research centers worldwide. So um, your approach has been very inspiring as well as your huge amount of experience. And it's uh, very interesting to hear that as you retire, you decide to actually unretire and launch on this um, pretty ambitious project. So I will not say any more on this and hand over to you, Diana. Thank you to all our speakers for joining us today. And we can't hear, wait to hear more about all your fabulous work in this place. Well, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and you know, the, uh, this is a, a very uh, exciting uh, new phase of my life uh, because, you know, I've been working uh, uh, in science and now I'm uh, able to do something more creative and, and, and I'm, uh, you know, really enjoying that. And, and it's, you know, really exciting for me to be uh, at, uh, at conferences at, uh, like, uh, like this. Um, and we've developed this project called the New Face for Leprosy, um, and uh, uh, Tom has uh, uh, mentioned it. But I just want to give you some really some key facts about leprosy um, because you know this is very 
important when people are thinking about leprosy um, and the, you know, what their background to, to leprosy is because um, leprosy is spread, spread by the mycobacterium uh, that Tom showed you and what happens is that a small percentage of patients, untreated patients, cough and sneeze at the, uh, their bacteria out into the environment um, and then people breathe them in uh, and uh, and they get leprosy. But most, so firstly, most people are not infectious. Um, and secondly, most people don't develop leprosy. So many people meet the, the, the leprosy germ, but only a few people that uh, develop it. Um, and the kind of leprosy that you get is uh, determined by uh, uh, your own host immune response. And so there's a whole range of different kinds of leprosy uh, that uh, that you can get and so that's a, that's a, a challenging for the for clinicians the important thing is that it that is that it affects the skin and the nerves and so you get patches in the skin uh, which is how you diagnose it but the 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 big challenge is that you also get inflammation uh, in the nerves and so you uh, have loss of sensation in your hands and feet and so you're at risk of burning your your hands and feet we're actually very lucky because we've got uh, very effective uh, antibiotics for treating the leprosy um, and uh, who uh, provides uh, the, these drugs uh, that the, uh, <coughs> which are called the uh, uh, multi-drug therapy um, and uh, they comprise uh, uh, rifampicin Dapsone and, uh, and clofazamine. Um, and so WHO sends the drugs out to the national the, the leprosy programs. So nobody should have to pay for their, the, for their leprosy drugs. However, the uh, leprosy causes chronic damage to nerves and that uh, damage can uh, uh, continue uh, uh, pro uh, uh, progressing after you've been treated. Um, and that's, uh, that, that's also a major part of the challenge of the disease. The other thing is that we we uh, see about uh, two hundred and twenty thousand new cases globally. So it's still a big problem, uh, and the countries that have had the, the biggest problem are the, uh, India, Brazil, uh, Indonesia, and, uh, the, and Nigeria. And what happens when one searches for the leprosy on the web, one just sees negative pictures. Um, and uh, uh, these are the, uh, the with disability. Uh, and the reason that people put these dramatic pictures up, it's, um, you know, partly the historical, um, partly because doctors are sharing, you know, pictures of severe disease. Uh, but also because the, the NGOs put them there uh, so that they can raise funds for leprosy because, the, the, you know, it's the, 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 uh, and, and this is very unfortunate because this has really, you know, strengthened uh, the, 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 the negative images associated with leprosy. And what's not seen, uh, in the, you know, in these, uh, the, uh, uh um, searches are that, you know, leprosy is curable. Uh, and that most people are cured with antibiotics and that family and friends are at low risk. So what we've the, uh, so these are the, uh, uh, images of leprosy, you know, from, from the web. Uh, so that, you know, that these are the uh, Norwegian patients, you know, from, uh, the 19th century. Uh, that's also a historical birth. Uh, and then uh, there are more the, the recent uh, the photos uh, the, from uh, 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 current uh, times. So what I after what I wanted to do was I wanted to create a more positive image of leprosy, um, and uh, the, I started this work um, with uh, the, a social engagement grant um, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and what we wanted to do was. We wanted to photograph individuals affected by the, the leprosy, but in their, their in their normal life, and we wanted to interview them about their story, a talk about the diagnosis, you know, hurdles, whether they'd used traditional medicine, 
uh, what problems they'd had with the uh, treatment um, stigma, you know, what had helped uh, and what had, uh, what had given them uh, hope. And so we started this, uh, this work in uh, Ethiopia uh, in September 2018. And I did that uh, with Sever Lambert, who's uh, uh, an Ethiopian, uh, who's uh, a part of our, our team and working uh, on leprosy uh, in Addis Ababa. And I did this with uh, Alex Kumar, um, uh, who's also the, the photographer who's done a lot of good work on uh, uh, photographing uh, 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 NTDs and, uh, and health. And he was also a student of mine at, uh, at the London School. So this is a, a picture the, of, the, of Messe. Um, and uh, the, she said, you know, I took uh, holy water as treatment for seven years uh, before I came to the, the alert at the hospital. Uh, and then uh, um, this man uh, is a the taxi driver. Uh, and, you know, he now often takes people, you know, uh, suspects, suspects people with leprosy and takes them to the, the alert. And, uh, uh, and he says, you know, uh, when I meet newly diagnosed people in the waiting area, I tell them that I've had leprosy too and that they should not lose hope and that the treatment that uh, they can be that, like me with uh, intact hands and feet. So again, very, powerful the, the positive uh, messages there and then this lady uh, she works in uh, uh, the, the, the weaving uh, the a section at the, uh, the, the um, uh, patients of the uh, uh, area outside the camp uh, outside the hospital and she said she said uh, I don't believe it's an inherited disease you should see my beautiful grandchildren again very powerful message because you know uh, people uh, fear that that uh, their leprosy is a uh, is a hereditary. So we um, <coughs> uh, made these uh, photos and we put together uh, people's uh, the stories. And I was very keen that the first to the showing of these should be in Ethiopia because I felt that this was work that we'd done with. Ethiopians, and so uh, we should uh, go back there. And uh, uh, so uh, World Leprosy Day um, is on the, the last Sunday that, uh, in January uh, each year. Uh, and the, in uh, uh, the, the major leprosy endemic countries, there will all be always be lots of activities on the World Leprosy Day. So uh, we went up to Gonda um, in northern Ethiopia. Uh, and the, there was a, the, a weekend of, of, uh, of events. So we, we had um, uh, a football match on Saturday morning and a march around, uh, around the hospital. And then on the Sunday, uh, we displayed the, the photos of the uh, people with their stories. And their stories were written in uh, Amharic and English. Uh, again, uh, to make them that accessible for the, you know for the people who to, the, uh, who told us that the, uh, their, uh, their 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 stories, um, and uh, so this uh, the, this was a uh, um, very the, the important event. And what was lovely was that um, uh, the, this is a, a lady you know who's been very active at the, in the uh, leprosy the, the uh, um, uh, politics uh, the, and improving things for, for leprosy patients in Ethiopia and uh, the, and she looked at these at, at the photos and she said oh, I didn't know we were so beautiful and so you know that that uh, again was very you know important to, uh, a positive uh, the, uh, message so what we've done with the with the new face for leprosy is that we've had to uh, Active participation of leprosy affected individuals, um, and, uh, people, uh, in leprosy NGOs have been very interested uh, in this project. Um, and, uh, uh, the Wikipedia entry on leprosy has been modified and it, and it no longer has uh, the, 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 the very the severe photos. 
we had uh, two of the articles in the Lancet, um, and uh, we had a, a plenary session at the International Leprosy Con uh, Congress in in, uh, in Manila. Um, uh, again, uh, talking about uh, the, 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 this, uh, this project, um, uh, and <coughs> Alice Cruz, uh, the, uh, um, the first director that shared the platform uh, uh, with us there. And we then went to India. Uh, so Tom and I went to India and, uh, and we photographed the, the patients the, there. So this is uh, um, the article from uh, from the Lancet um, and uh, you know, the, the picturing has a, a, a new face for, for leprosy. Uh, and that's uh, that's uh, the, 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 the couple who for uh, the leprosy couple who've uh, got to married. So when one could maybe call this you know love in the time of uh, the, uh, of leprosy. Um, and we then uh, went to India uh, and uh, uh, we were supported by by lepra. Um, and we interviewed and photographed patients uh, in Hyderabad. Um, and uh, we. Spent a, uh, a, a week in Mehbub Nagar, the, 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 the south of Hyderabad, and then a week in in Hyderabad. You know, and uh, uh, what was important was that you know that uh, the lepra staff you uh, know talked to the patients about the project uh, that, uh, beforehand. You know, and and we got informed consent uh, before they before. Uh, 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 visiting them um, and photographing them, um, and 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 you know, and they were also you know able to uh, drop out if they if they changed their minds. And actually, the, the, um, uh, uh, when we were there uh, one day, the, 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 uh, a woman um, who uh, uh, had a, a child with leprosy, she changed her mind because uh, she didn't uh, uh, want her. Uh, her the uh, uh, daughter's that photographed. So the, this is uh, the Manakama, um, and uh, I've actually I've known her since she was sixteen, um, uh, because she uh, worked as a, as a, uh, uh, a cleaner in the guest house in Hyderabad, um, and then she did, then she was uh, diagnosed uh, uh, very quickly, um, and so she, she's just had very uh, minimal symptoms. And then it was a, a real pleasure to, to, to see Munia Khan but again. Um, he uh, has had the, the, the problems with his hands. Um, and I, I remember very vividly that, that from uh, the, uh, uh, 30 years ago when he talked about the, the problems of, the, of playing the, uh, the tabla uh, uh, with the pain that he had in his hands as a result of uh, uh, his, his leprosy and uh, uh, the ongoing inflammation in his nerves. Um, and uh, you've seen these uh, photographs of, of Aya. And again, you know, very interesting man. So, you know, he he, he was an engineer. Um, and uh, uh, when he did, uh, uh, and firstly, it took him some time to be diagnosed with leprosy. Um, and again, that's that. That's often uh, the problem. It's often worsened in the private sector. And he was given very d d false information. He was told that he might die, and he was also charged for his medicines. Um, and so, when he wrote on Tom's photograph, he mentioned that uh, that he'd uh, 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 been charged for for his medicine. Um, this is really what we want to do. We we want to you know help uh, abandon uh, the the stigma of the, of leprosy. Uh, and this year, the, this young man is from uh, uh, you know, uh, Ethiopia uh, um, to uh, Addis Ababa. So what we want to do is to, you know we want all the images to, to be like this. Um, and we had a presentation at the House of Lords. Um, and uh, we've set up a website with uh, people's photographs and, and stories. Um, and uh, we launched that, you know, on World Leprosy Day um, a couple of months ago. <clears throat> well, it's actually just uh, still six weeks ago. <laughs> um, and we've had a lot of uh, 
positive responses, you know, um, uh, from people that are across the world, you know, including uh, WHO, who wanted to uh, put a link on their websites uh, to uh, uh, the images that we've got about leprosy, you know, and, uh, you know, what I feel is that, you know, every NGO should have uh, positive voices from people affected by leprosy and, and we're also, you know, working um, uh, with the, the other organisations who are working on stigma such as uh, the, uh, 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 the International Leprosy Association and, uh, and WHO. And we plan to interview uh, patients in, uh, in other countries. So I just uh, want to, you know, thank the, the leprosy effective individuals who've shared their stories and images. Um, and uh, the, the funding for this project was from LEPRA and, uh, the, and the London School. Um, and, uh, uh, and we now uh, have our own uh, website. And uh, this, yes. um, uh, so I've experienced leprosy and I know well. And this is a, yes to take you back to our uh, our uh, uh, logo and the you know uh, the logo is really you know about to hope you know the uh, lo looking up and being uh, positive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, that was incredibly informative. Um, rarely do. Um, does a focus on leprosy focus so much on the experience of the affected person? Um, it's really a testament to yourself as a researcher that kind of the culmination of your work um, as a scientist, as a medical professional, really rests in changing the narrative about affected persons to a wider audience, but also for these communities. So. Uh, that was really fascinating, really interesting, and such a great example um, and an inspiration for the whole neglected tropical disease community, and in fact, many diseases beyond that, of the perfect kind of marriage between health and cre the creative industry. So uh, they were very excited about that project, and uh, we were... Uh, you pitched the, the bar very high. We're inspired right from the start with Tom's photographs. So thank you to both of you um, for really explaining and sharing that project with us. Hello, everybody. Um, I've divided my presentation into two, um, talking a bit about my personal work with leprosy um, and then the New Face project. Um, I thought it'd be helpful to talk about my personal work because how I've developed as a photographer and thought about photographing uh, those affected by leprosy, those that are marg marginalised as, as a white British male working abroad, um, I think is probably quite important to how the New Face project has developed. Um, so I've, I've uh, been photographing leprosy since 2009. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Hear yeah, I can hear you well. Yeah. Um, so I've been photographing since 2009 and uh, I finished university in 2008 uh, having studied zoology um, but knew, knowing that I wanted to be a photographer and was really interested in documentary photography. Yes, so uh, I've been photographing since 2009. Um, it started off, uh, I, I knew two friends that had volunteered at a le leprosy hospital in Nepal. So I went there um, because it was quite convenient to organise, and uh, the first couple of years was all all self-funded. Um, and uh, when I was there for that first time, spending uh, six weeks in this leprosy hospital, um, I met several people. One of whom was particularly um, uh, important, a podiatrist called Dr. Hugh Cross, um, who I had long chats with about the what leprosy is like across the world and I thought this sounds like an interesting subject and Hugh basically encouraged me to um, maybe pursue it um, uh, as, as uh, you know a neglected in terms of um, how it's um, uh, uh, shown across shown across the world and shown visually um, uh, but also um, 
talk about in a, in a bit of a different way. And I don't think I did that initially, but I was intrigued nonetheless. Um, I I then I organized to go to Nigeria, um, uh, self-funded as well, and then Togo the following year. And then through a blog, various NGOs picked up and um, asked me to photograph for them, which became commissions. Um, and so what started off as a, a six week project turned into a one year, then two year and then five year. And I now realize that I'm um, probably, I hope I'm going to photograph leprosy for the rest of my life. Um, uh, this is, these are screenshots from my website, which I'm, I'm still changing, but actually um, appropriately, it rather shows the sort of um, progress that I'm sort of making. So this is how I started photographing a lot. I was very interested in black and white um, reportage um, influenced by a great um, tradition of, uh, I suppose, mainly Western photojournalism. Um, and I was quite naive um, about my role. Um, and really, I saw these stories and I thought, um, there's, I want to show people what's happening. I want to raise awareness. Um, I want people to know that leprosy still exists and it's still very hard on people. Um, and and leprosy is very closely associated with poverty. Um, so that was a large part of what I was photographing and I didn't shy away from that. Um, and some of these images are quite hard to see and they're quite um, cliched um, and uh, uh, yeah, what you might expect perhaps. Um, and I gradually realized that uh, I, you know, there was a problem there and that I didn't really want to um, reinforce stereotypes of leprosy. And I started photograph, making sure that I didn't just photograph um, scenes that were quite painful to look at, but um, uh, scenes that were more tangible moments of joy, perhaps. Um, this is one of my favorite ones from earlier on. Um, and, and then I, and then I, you know, there were various things that I realized um, as I started photographing NGOs, I had to photograph in color. There's various reasons why I liked black and white. It's easier to photograph in black and white, I think. Um, but um, I've recently started going back through archives and putting the old black and white photos into color. Um, and I think there's a strong, uh, yeah, historical association with black and white photography, especially of, um, especially of things like poverty. Um, that have reinforced stereotypes, especially in things like the sub-Saharan region, sub uh, yeah, sub-Saharan Africa. And, um, and I, I realized that I couldn't, I had to think very carefully if I wanted to put things in black and white um, and continue that way. So I largely photograph in color now. Um, and this, so I've recently been going back uh, this year. I haven't been traveling at all this last year. So um, I've been going back through my archive and coming through these old photos. Um, and maybe this one is slightly more representative of what I do today, where it's not sensationalist in any way, but still shows um, uh, something that's happening. Um, this is uh, the counselor at a, a leprosy hospital in Nepal, and Andaban speaking with Buddha, a patient there. Um, and, you know, it shows that uh, he's clearly going through something and there's some some sort of emotion on his face, but it's not sensationalizing it. It's um, showing the scene and showing a sort of connection between the two of them. Um, but I've been thinking quite a lot about different ways um, to challenge um, how to go about and, uh, photographing uh, the marginalized and um, how I could make it a bit more human and put a bit more of the power in their hands. This is one of the sort of early attempts at that, at um, a leprosy colony in Nigeria, which I visited for the second time in 2014. And um, I spent three weeks there on commission. Um, and actually the man in the top right, um, Baba Joshua, was spoke um, excellent English and worked as well as, as, well as being in the, um, living in the leprosy community, was an administrator in the hospital. And he helped me for sort of three weeks and I was chatting with him and I said I wanted to I wanted to show uh, I wanted to give some prints back of people. Um, but when would be a good time to do it? And he said, well, why don't you photograph them after church on a Sunday and everyone's wearing their best clothes and that will be how they want to look. Um, 
So I, I, the pastor allowed me to make an announcement in church and I set up my camera outside and I told people that they could stand however they wanted and I give them a print back. And it resulted in this series um, of, of uh, uh, people wearing their Sunday best. And so I called it Sunday best. Um, and so it's, you know, a small early attempt at, at just being aware of who I am and how people might want to be portrayed. Um, and uh, one thing that was good about this is that I photographed everyone irrespective of I, some of them will not have leprosy. Their parents might um, will not have had leprosy, sorry, have been affected by leprosy. Um, but I, it, it didn't really matter. The point was just to photograph them as, as humans, as part of this community. Um, and this was quite interesting. I, she hadn't gone to church that morning, but she found out that I'd done it. And so uh, asked me to go back and take her photo there as well. Um, and she wasn't sure if she wanted to pose without, um, with or without the, the peg leg that supports her, um, her. Well, she's got a quite damaged foot. She's not um, got an amputation. And uh, so I did both, both photos and she decided she preferred the one which showed um, the peg leg. Um, I, th I think partly because she's smiling in that, but she said that it was um, uh, that she felt like that was more representative of who she was. So I found that quite interesting and unexpected. Um, I started asking people to write on photographs um, relatively early as well. Um, it's an old, old trick that's been done in photography, but I really feel that it's something that gives agency to the person. And initially I started doing it by um, going off to print shops when I could, if I was spending a long period of time there and making a photo on asking to write on them. And, and then later with Polaroids, just because it's more immediate, um, even though it's smaller and uh, a bit less space to write on. Um, so this is, um, yeah, it's a physiotherapy unit at a leprosy hospital in India. And um, it was one of the photos I've been doing as reportage that I thought I, I quite liked, so I printed it and went and spoke with Archana, who's the one on the left who wrote um, that short statement that says, my hand was deformed and so my husband was not happy. He started troubling me and beating me as I could not work on the sewing machine because of my hand. Um, so it's about making that sort of connection and there's a conversation that obviously precedes that um, and uh, but ultimately, it's up to them exactly what they want to write, what message they want to say. Um, and here's another example of a man from the same hospital when I first started doing it. And he wanted to remain anonymous, but was happy to blank out his face that much. I, I asked if he minded showing his eyes and he said, no, no, that's fine. Um, but this is all his writing and his scribbling. And he wrote, I have ulcers on my feet for which I take medicine and treatment. If I'd received MDT, the treatment, uh, when I had patches, I would not have got these deformities. In spite of me being so educated, I did not know that anesthetic patches are a symptom of leprosy. Everyone in my family knows I had leprosy, but I had them all examined for leprosy, but I have not told anybody else. There should be public awareness done. So as well as, as, well as telling a sort of personal story and um, um, the, of what he's gone through, He's also talking about bigger political um, uh, ideas of um, uh, how how well leprosy is um, uh, in medical education or um, advertise the public or yeah whether people know about it. So I wanted to start talking about these things, and it was good to find those um, who were literate and um, had ideas that they could write out for themselves. And these are more that I've been doing. I won't show the translations for everyone. Um, but these are on some of the commissions uh, for the Polaroids. And it, the idea is it gives them a voice in their own language and they're not necessarily messages um, for us as um, for, for a Western audience that maybe is not um, does not have leprosy on our doorstep, but um, also messages for their neighbours and for people to see. So um, these ideas played quite strongly into the New Face project. Uh, and this is one I did. It's maybe slightly unexpected. She's um, now a good friend. Uh, she's Brazilian, but was diagnosed with leprosy in Germany. Um, and I um, 
she this is when she came to visit um, an exhibition of mine in London about five years ago or so. Um, uh, and she's written a book about what it was like to be diagnosed, um, you know, in a country with excellent medical services um, and still go through the reactions. So, um, um, but she's, uh, it was a very interesting book that she's written, if you're, if you're interested, uh, The Living Disease, The Living Death, The Struggle with a Long Forgotten Disease. Um, and she's written in German and Portuguese and English. Um, and I think that's probably quite, quite key, the phrase at the top, I haven't let leprosy define me. And then this is a more recent exploration I've done um, where I, I've been thinking for a while about, you know, handing over full transition. And I think probably Lara's going to speak in much um, more depth about this um, sort of thing, but handing over the camera to um, those affected. Um, and in fact, this was, wasn't was for to those affected by leprosy, but were to, um, to like young adults and teenagers brought up in a leprosy colony where their parents had been affected or grandparents and they still wanted to talk about the social stigma and problems that they went through just by being related and associated with that colony and so I um, gave over a load of cameras to four of them and we had about three three and a half weeks um, where I'd help them photograph and talk about how they could maybe represent their life. And we found um, old photos from family albums and scanned them and Xeroxed them. And then made these large collages um, and then exhibited them in the colony at the end of the, the session. Um, so um, I didn't take any of these photos, um, but uh, I, I helped sort of uh, in, in sort of putting them together and we talked through different ideas and I talked through different ways and then they ulti ultimately made the final choices. And some of them are completely their own ideas. It was, it was a really um, amazing process to go through. Um, I'll just say quickly, so this is um, uh, uh, Rishi um, and he wanted to write something on the collage uh, and, he, and I said, well, what do you want to write? And he sat down and he wrote a very quick paragraph and it was in incredible how open and vulnerable he was and willing to talk about his relationships with his parents and um, the pressures on him um, uh, to to provide for the family um, by getting in uh, doing very well at school and he said I can carry on writing and and he just poured all of this out um, onto the onto the onto the collage and so um, I, I could I could you know as a as a photographer going in listening interviewing editing I could have never got even close to what um, he's put on here so um, yeah it was a very different experience um, and here are the other collages. Um, this is Jaya. Um, we talked early on about, she said she was, she really loved green and forest, but there wasn't much around her. And I said, well, why don't you go and photograph as much as you can? And then we made this little um, collage of, of a sort of forest at the, the top of the, the page is something aspirational. And it talks of maybe trying to escape um, the, 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 the colony, the idea of the colony as well. Um, and then this is mega, um, and you can't quite see the details, but there's quite surreal photographs, and um, she's sort of put them together so they look quite strange. And um, she takes a lot of selfies as well with her friends. That's quite usual. So I said, well, why, why not? Yeah, put these in. Um, so she put these in as well. So a lot of these were her choice. And then Suraj, who talks about his his father and watching his father as someone affected and um, living in this colony. Um, but then he talks also on the right hand side about his future and his worries for his own future and how he wants to be an actor, but knows that's probably not possible. But then he's seen all his friends um, uh, turn to drugs and, and alcohol and crime. And he's worried that he might go that route um, because that's sort of what seems to happen. Um, and so this was, it was amazing seeing all of this. Um, so yeah, I thought I'd summarize that quickly. Um, I, I put my contact there and um, I've got, I set up recently an, an Instagram, which I'm doing daily sort of posts of these sorts of things, if you're interested in that. Um, and that brings me to the new face for Leprosy Project. Um, Diana brought me into this, um, in 2019, um, we'd been in touch for a while. 
Um, and uh, I, I'm going to let her talk about uh, the sort of uh, other details of it. Um, but uh, I suppose I've got, I'll, I'll summarize it quickly. So it's, um, it's essentially trying to create a new uh, image. I'll talk a bit more about how um, there's a lot of negative imagery, especially when you search for it. And she thought, well, as newly diagnosed patients um, uh, being told they've got leprosy, these days they will search for it and they see a lot of negative imagery that creates a lot of fear and stigma. And so this is trying to counteract that a bit. Um, and we recently came up with this logo here of someone looking quite hopeful, but obviously non, not gender specific. And I, I actually am, um, I'm going to talk about the images and process, but I got that image from um, one of the ones that I shot in um, India with Diana, um, where I'd asked this woman to just stand and breathe calmly and um, relax and close her eyes and just think of things that make her really happy. And we'd had this conversation where she was quite distressed um, uh, about some of the things that were happening cur currently in her life. And she got this, this image of sort of calmness. And I thought, well, it'd be nice to base that um, um, uh, logo on what, what I felt was quite, quite a beautiful um, moment. Um, Diana will talk a bit more about this man, Munia Khan, but this is a photograph of him um, playing the tabla and uh, similarly to the previous photo, I, but I didn't need to say anything to him. We, we showed his plays and he just got lost in the music. Um, and so a lot of this project, I mean, essentially, I think this project is about making sure you photograph people as people, as humans and showing, concentrating on the humanity and not um, the disease, even though maybe that is what sort of links them together. Um, I thought I'd talk very briefly about, so this is just a, a photograph I took many years before of the bacteria and then Munia Khan. And it's just, it seems very obvious, but what, how we relate two different things, um, two different photos and someone seeing that photo rather than the bacteria, which they know they have next to someone that is, uh, living in ex extreme pro poverty and a slightly abstract black and white image and um, showing great disability. Um, yeah, it's, um, it can be, it can be really difficult um, to see that. And as I say, it creates a lot of fear. So having these two images together, maybe um, I just wanted to illustrate the example of the power of putting images together and what they can say. Um, this is another one, Chilakama. Um, and I think, Diana will show another photo of her when she's got a big grin on her face. But I thought I'd show this other one. Um, uh, they're complex stories that people tell. Um, they're not all happy stories. They're not all sad stories. Um, and I and photographs are very quite one dimensional. But I wanted to make sure that if I did photograph uh, looking a bit more serious, that I, I got down low. Um, I gave her a bit of height. It gives that sense of dignity. It's a very common usual trick for, as a photographer and I've noticed going back through my archive that from those first few years um, a lot more of them were looking down whereas I then began to change and photograph people straight on or looking slightly up and I think that that does help with them um, uh, telling uh, yeah giving a sort of more positive outlook of who they are and um, here's another example um, Srinivasaram um, and yeah, another another example, a uh, couple of images together, um, Saidulu, um, who had an amazing smile um, and a grin, you know, one of those things that's quite noticeable and infectious because he's grinning all the time. Um, and so I wanted that photo, but uh, then to show, show it with his work, and which is very ordinary photo of a, of a worker. It doesn't show anything that might hint at leprosy. Um, and the other photo there is, uh, you can you can just see there's, um, slight chlorine, which is one of the things that can happen with um, um, uh, the effects of the bacteria if it's not treated quickly. Um, but actually, that's it's, it barely features in the photo. It might not be noticeable if you didn't recognize it. Um, what, what's it what it's focusing, focusing on is, is who he is, the humanity. In that, well, in this case, the smile that's sort of um, uh, dominant. Um, showing back to Munir again, um, I wanted to when he still plays the tabla, it is very painful on his um, hands if he plays too vigorously. 
Um, but I, so I want to sort of focus on that and the aspect, but I thought putting these three images together to make sure that it includes his face and isn't just focusing on the body parts um, is also probably quite key. Um, and then this sort of multiple set of images of Vien Aya um, talking with Diana. And I, th I think there's something, video does this quite well, but then photography, it's all there together. And I do like still photography in that way, but um, uh, I, I like how there's all of these different expressions and nuances in what he's trying to say and the emotions that you might pick up from then reading about the conversation. Um, and uh, they say something about who he is generally. And, and it just builds up this slightly more complex picture of an individual um, rather than a single image. Um, and then, uh, at the end, uh, I did a Polaroid of him and he chose to write, um, uh, I was tricked three times at three places before I found out that treatment is totally free. Um, and so that very small sentence, but that gives a lot of sort of snippet into the problems um, people might have with being diagnosed, but at the same time, making sure that anyone that reads it knows that treatment is completely free worldwide. Um, and this, this is uh, Zaibun Begum, um, who's written in Telangana. Um, and again, Diana, I think, was going to show a different photo of her, but I thought I'd show these two slightly um, uh, different different expressions. Some one more sober and a uh, somber, and one more of a uh, um, yeah, this cheeky grin that she has. Um, and she wrote, "My name is Zaibun Begum. I have suffered for three years. I started taking medicines regularly, and now I'm happy." Take your medicines on time. So mainly what we were asking was um, for what message would they give to someone else who's just been diagnosed. Uh, this is Sultana Bagum. Um, and I I did want to show her feet, but again, I wanted to make sure that her herself, her face, um, who she was and uh, not just concentrate on that. But I also want to show with the feet that she'd just been to a wedding and put henna on her feet. And even though one you can see has been um, damaged as a result of leprosy, uh, she's not been afraid to do it and to show who she is and um, not let that disease sort of stop her from partaking in, in life. Um, and then this is uh, the, the Polaroid I took for her, which is written in Urdu, um, which I, I still haven't got a translation for it yet. So if anyone speaks Urdu, um, otherwise I'm going to uh, send out to a few people. Um, but again, it was a message for those maybe that read really Urdu. So, um, and then this is one of the um, uh, leprosy technicians that works for Lepra. Um, we were working for Lepra. Um, oh, we worked in collaboration with Lepra, the leprosy charity um, NGO in India, when we went out there. Um, so I thought I'd show this photo of Babu Rao in his office. And I think actually some of the posters on the wall on the right are ones that Diana commissioned quite early on her um, when she became uh, the UK leprologist. Um, she will tell you more about that perhaps. Um, and then I thought I'd show a few photos of the process, Diana sitting and interviewing those. Um, Munia, she'd actually treated 30 years out, 30 years before. Um, um, she, she realized the connection when we went to meet him. Um, so there was a nice um, a serendipitous moment there. And I'll show you a few more of, um, of just these scenes. And yeah, it was quite, just quite important how we go about the process and speak with people about what they want to say, whether they want to take part, um, whether they want to be have their photos be shown in Hyderabad um, or over here or online and that sort of ramifications. I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about consent at some point, but that was all very important to part of the process. Um, and of course, she is a, a, a doctor, so she made sure that um, uh, she checked. She checked um, people that had any concerns while they were. But yeah, it was a, a very enjoyable and rewarding thing to do. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to how the new face for leprosy project is going to evolve as well. Um, here's one of the team photos at the Blue Peter Research Center in Hy Hyderabad, um, which I yeah, I won't say any more about that. Um, um, so there's the new face for leprosy. Um, there's a the website there um, is still in development, but there's some stories on it. Um, 
And there's an email which I think might not have been set up. So I put my own email and I think Diana's got her email in her presentation, which I hope is ready now. So um, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Tom, and let the images speak for themselves. And so thank you for that. Um, beautiful work and uh, really engaging. Loved, absolutely loved the fact that it was so participatory and having um, individuals handwriting there. So uh, really wonderful. I was going to ask you to put a link to the book, but I see uh, Matthias Duck has done that. And I salute you, Matthias. Hello. Nice to see you. Nice to see lots of very familiar faces in the chat as well. Um, Stephen Nabib, welcome. Bungari Wambui as well. Um, uh, we've got uh, Maxon Agnolito here, Anita Macri. Hi, um, Anita, I think interviewed you just very recently about this work. Just a huge thank you to Tom. Um, so we're going to move a little bit away now from uh, looking acutely at neglected tropical diseases, but we're still going to be thinking uh, very much about what it takes to change current narratives of perhaps neglected communities or forgotten stories. And um, this is where the wonderful and incredible work of the Ledima Foundation comes in. And we're really honored and privileged today to have the chance to speak in a bit more detail with uh, Lara Utian Preston. Lara, you are CEO of the Ledima Foundation. And I'm sure that a lot of what Tom and Diana have just um, described really resounds with you and your work and uh, more importantly, your philosophy. Um, you, you're doing things slightly differently. So first and foremost, you're a filmmaker. And I suppose your main um, focus uh, is to really highlight and bring more and more women um, in the creative space highlight their work. Um, is this just an equality thing or does that, how does that change the actual narrative of what is being um, shown through these films? Uh, to be here. Um, yeah, so, um, so what we what we do at the Ladima Foundation is really facilitate um, the training and development, access to opportunities, recognition for women in film and content across across Africa. So it's it's an equality thing and, and more. Um, I think um, you know it's an understanding that when when women's voices are heard um, and when there's a diversity of views, whether that's from any neglected community, um, everyone benefits. Um, not just not just women. Um, families benefit, men benefit, societies benefit. So um, I mean, it's no secret to anyone that that you know certain voices are more privileged than others. Certain voices control the narratives. So um, and again, you know, very much when you're talking about whether it's um, I think maybe people who are affected by illnesses, people who are affected by poverty, people who are affected by discrimination, um, women very much. Um, fall within that, so it's, it's almost like a double um, issue. So, like, I mean, I think there was the one woman who said her husband beat her because she couldn't sew. So, not only is she being victimized because she has been affected by leprosy, she's being victimized because she's a woman. Um, and so, the diversity of voices is essential to changing everyone's lives. Um, and I think, you know, within the African context, um, it's historically been Africa spoken about. Um, probably in the same way that the, you know the, uh, the communities of people with leprosy have been spoken about. So that idea of yeah of, of democratization of content, of uh, people telling their own stories. I mean, our one of our our main payoff line is African stories have African women have stories to tell. Let's watch them. Um, the film is a very powerful way to do that. Obviously, these days um, with streaming platforms and YouTube and you know, younger generations, everything that's being consumed these days almost is, is visual. So what you're seeing reflected on your screens becomes your reality. So if you see stereotypes of women, if you see stereotypes of men, and that's the thing as well, often when you find um, only one voice or one um, type of person behind the camera, you're only getting one representation on the camera, um, so in, in, on the screen. And that's victim. That's that's often a negative perception of men as well. So I mean, if women are being shown as abused, men are being shown as abusers. Um, 
So it's really about democratizing who's creating the content to change what's on the screen, because what we see on the screen can become reality um, for many, many people. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think what we're doing is, is not dissimilar um, in terms of empowering African women who um, to pick up a phone or a camera and, and to tell their stories. That's uh, really fascinating. And um, what we are going, what we've seen and what actually will be explored in a lot more detail uh, further down in the festival is really this um, idea of putting the means of creation in the hands of who you're talking about, of these audiences. And you're right, the stories of patients, the stories of women have been uh, sometimes told for them. And um, as you said, the image kind of coins the story. So um, by changing the image, uh, you can quite easily rewrite the story. I think um, one of the most recent projects that you've been involved in, um, just thinking about COVID now and how that was kind of a huge shock to the system uh, across the world. And uh, I suppose that prompted you um, to find a way for isolated people to kind of tell their stories. So is there a particular project that you um, that evolved out of that? Yeah, so um, with our with support from our partner, which is the Deutsche Welle Academy in Germany, um, last year during the very hard lockdowns that were happening across the world, um, we put a call out for African women to create a two minute film about life under lockdown. How were they being affected by lockdown? Good or bad, um, positive or negative. Um, and there was only a three week window and it was for everyone. You didn't have to be a professional filmmaker. You could just pick up like a set of phone. And we got over 200 entries within a very short space of time, it was an incredible response. And then um, there were 10 selected films that were then further screened on a variety of platforms. And it was just incredible. The two things that came out was the unity and diversity. So there were so many different experiences and from east, west, you know, north, south of the continent. But there was a lot of similarities. Sadly, some of those were about gender-based violence and abuse, um, mm -hmm. the broken care that falls on women at the best of times and then even more so in situations like this. But there were also real threads of commonality in terms of resilience, community and hope. And so, yeah, it was it was an incredibly rewarding project to work on. And like I say, some of the women you could see were professional filmmakers, but others had literally just picked up a camera for the first time. And they all just said what an empowering experience it was to just tell their story. And um, you know, so it's, there also has to be, yeah, there has to be the mechanisms. We, very, we speak very much at the work we do about intentionality. And if you don't have an intentionality to allow different voices, to privilege different voices, to enable, it's not just something that happens. It's, it's not just an, a process of evolution where eventually you'll get women or minorities or whatever it is, you know, speaking up and being heard. You have to have an intentionality, whether that's in um, film festivals, or, you know, and uh, you know, there was a huge movement around getting more women's films in festivals. Whether it's in, um, I suppose, in the medical space as well. There's not an intentionality to put the patient at the center. There's not intentionality to center women's and other people's voices. It's not something that's just going to happen. So I think that's what's also really important is that we need more and more initiatives that are specifically aimed at changing a narrative and enabling the people to change that narrative by telling their own stories. And that's really interesting that you mentioned um, that your call out was for anyone, filmmakers or non-filmmakers, um, because yes, lots of people must certainly have an eye for a story, but unless, as you say, you have that intentionality of becoming a filmmaker, they, they may never get shared. So it's been a wonderful actually. And um, there is a show reel of um, a few seconds of this project. So perhaps this would be a great time to um, share that with our audience. So if you don't mind, we'll take just a few seconds break and um, I'll just play the video.
you very much, uh, Lara, for sharing that. And uh, I suppose this really opens up the discussion based on uh, Tom and Diana's work and yourself as well on um, putting the voices uh, at the community level, really at the audience level. And that is a, a major and fundamental part, for example, of a very technical document, the Roadmap for Neglected Tropical Disease Control that was just recently released at the World Health Organization, um, really tracing the path to 2030 uh, with those to reach those all important um, elimination goals. So the approaches that you've, the three of you have described so far in addition to being uh, in an incredible opportunity to highlight patient voices will also be hugely important uh, as part of much um, more widespread and uh, global kind of disease control framework. So on all levels, um, some fantastic work. Um, I think just before we move on a, a, to the discussion, it'd be really great to hear more from John. Uh, John Ferguson, you're also a photographer and uh, to really, we've we've spoken about the patient, we've spoken about the creators with Laura and um, John. Your approach really thinks about and focuses on the audiences because on your audiences, it is really about bringing um, those stories to a very wide, um, varied audience. Uh, John, you've got quite an interesting um, double life, I'd say, in photography. Um, we, I can't see you at the moment. I believe maybe your uh, camera is shielded or we, we can't see you. Hopefully you can hear us and you can see us. Um, if not, I would recommend just refreshing the page. Um, I'm still of the switch it up and on yes. school of thought. There you are. Brilliant. Hi, John. Yeah. Hi, hi. Well, my work revolves around photojournalism. That's my background in documentary photography, photojournalism. And um, um, I don't know. I don't know how I came to came to become uh, um, involved in that sort of work with NGOs. It just happened organically, I think. My and their interests aligned at the same same time. Same opportunities arise. Arose. Uh, what I would add in terms of how. Um, you know, your work with NGOs um, has really influenced um, some of what, what I believe is very close to your heart. John, you've traveled um, as part of this work uh, to over 60 countries. You've covered things um, ranging from conflicts to disasters to zones, uh, but also major sporting events, major um, current events. So um, in all of this, I think your eye on misrepresented communities, but also overlooked communities has been uh, really interesting and very sharp. And um, I know by way of background, John's work is actually in a very sort of commercial kind of field, uh, working with celebrities or personal brands. So that this kind of very interesting double, double um, take on uh, the image and storytelling. So um, I'm speaking on behalf of John, <laughs> which is uh, not at all the idea of this panel, but I'm just waiting for John to uh, connect again. <clears throat> but perhaps before we see a bit more work from John, we could start. Um, and by the way, panelists, you're welcome to put your cameras on uh, as and when you, you, you're um, comfortable to do so. Uh, but perhaps we could just focusing on the work of you three and really uh, on those individuals that you've brought to life, empowered through the use of images. Um, we had here a few questions that have popped up in um, our chat and we've got one from Stephen Libby. So Stephen's uh, focusing on asking Tom and Diana, focusing on leprosy, but we'll open up and unpack those discussions um, towards other neglected communities, of course. So um, do you have any ideas on how to change the narrative about leprosy apart from, or in addition to perhaps individual stories of persons affected by leprosy, but in a much broader sense to create more urgency, attention and raise more awareness? Uh, so do we also need a new story for leprosy? Uh, so great question there by Stephen. And how do you and this, of course, applies to your work, Lara, as well. How do you move from that 
kind of very moving story of one individual to linking that to a much broader policy agenda or um, advocacy agenda and maybe even, you know, leveraging on some NGOs, international organizations, governments. How do you link that personal experience to a policy change? And in particular, in the case of leprosy, that's really interesting and relevant. Um, uh, you know, India, through the work of advocacy, and related to the um, position and condition and treatment of persons affected by leprosy, India actually changed some of their labor laws. So quite a, a substantial impact there. Um, Diana, what were your thoughts on, on this? Well, uh, yes, I, I'm, I'm always uh, very, very happy when, when people uh, uh, want to, want, you know, want to uh, improve the narrative because, you know, it means that they've, uh, that they've, you know, that, uh, uh, picked up the, the important message. Um, what I would say is that I think one does this in multiple ways, you know, and, and, you know, and you have, you know, you have to do it, you know, through, you know, uh, communities and, and, you know, and, uh, 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 arts and things. So, for instance, something that I was involved with, which, were, uh, I, I was very pleased about was, um, uh, uh, a novelist, uh, Victoria Hislop, wrote a book called *The Island* about um, about leprosy patients in Greece, um, and uh, the, the, and she came to me to to talk about it. Um, and actually, I was the I was the medical advisor on the book. Um, and when the book came out, and and what was fascinating because when she was Trying to sell the idea, you know, she she said, you know, that I've got a I've got a lot of the uh, uh, you know leprosy and a love story. And the the first publishers she went to said, well, we would like the leprosy, then we, we we would like the love story, but please leave out the leprosy. Um, and, and then, <laughs> and the, but then she went when she found uh, a publisher that was was sympathetic, um, and it was amazing because this this book um, was then picked up as summer book reading by Richard and Judy, and then you know it's now been made into a huge film in Greece, and you know and and so. That action has actually, you know, sort of, you know, rippled down in many, many ways. You know, and, you know, and, you know, many people, you know, have, you know, do have, you know, the, the, some, you know, uh, uh, better awareness, you know, about leprosy, you know, through, through reading the island. So I, I think that, that the, you know, things like that make me helpful. But on the other hand, you know, there's, you know, this huge history of stigma, you know, and, and, you know, uh, and, you know, and it's very much, you know, part of the religious narrative, um, you know, and, and I think that, that we have to, you know, that's why I, I say, you know, we have to combat it in, you know, in many different ways. Yeah, if I could um, also just add to that, I think, policy and um, and this changing the narrative need to go hand in hand. So I think more and more organizations are realizing that. So I mean, a lot of the work we do, and my colleague Adima is more on this, is on the policy and advocacy side with governments around, again, intentionality. So it's a similar process. So saying if you're going to have film funds, if you're going to support creatives and artists, make sure you're supporting at least 50% women, those kind of things. So it's, again, you know, the, the policy and the advocacy has to go hand in hand. Um, I, I I agree with um, uh, everything that uh, uh, Laura and Diana have just said. Um, I, I do think that um, I, when you say uh, apart from individual stories, I mean that's obviously a, that's a major part of it. And I think focusing on individual stories and uh, humans is um, must go hand in hand with all of these ideas of. Um, uh, of, of uh, I, I, yeah, working in larger narratives of um, uh, working with campaigns or working um, in film or all sorts of sort of media and um, you know I obviously have an interest in still photography and um, 
and art from that side of things and that's that's sort of that's one way but that's a quite, probably quite a limited audience in many ways and so um what, what i think is maybe related and a more interesting question is how do um uh, obviously with leprosy it's a lot of ngos that talk about leprosy and that's how a lot of people understand it from things these days apart from very old stories and so um how do they how do they help change these narratives while at the same time trying to make people care about the subject and traditionally for uh, several decades now the way that people have made to been uh, that people have been made to care is by showing them these quite debil debilitating and um, some harmful images when it comes to defining how um, other cultures, nations are perceived, but there's a lot of these things, things have been done from sort of a white Western point of view. So yeah, I'd like what Lara is doing with the Latimer Foundation, more collaborative work, um, putting the, the power of the narrative in um, the communities where uh, which are partly affected are the ways to do it. Um, how that's done is going to be, I think, a, a, whole, a whole load of diverse ways. And I, I feel like I'm mean, just exploring it in the new places and just exploring it. So, um, yeah, a lot of these to be written already um, in the future, I think. So we have a, a great question from Maxon Agnolito. Maxon, I'm not sure um, where you're tuning in from, your organization or country. Please let us know in the chat. It's always lovely to know. But Maxon was asking, um, is reminding us that NTDs, neglected tropical diseases, are of diverse nature and dimensions. <clears throat> Taking the case of schistosomiasis, for instance, how would we use photography to give narratives about its, its prevention? It's particularly interesting in that schistosomiasis um, is caught from unsafe waters, parasite in parasites in water. I'm sorry if I'm stating the obvious. Um, um, we do have quite a wide and broad audience. And um, this, uh, so despite a quite successful and um, simple treatment, pockets of persistent schistosomiasis do remain. And so without going into much the detail of the disease itself, what as... Um, what have you learned, Diana, from your work, but also as creatives, what would be your advice to Maxon or anyone really working in a neglected disease with quite complex kind of life cycles of parasites and complex behaviors amongst the affected communities? Like, what should we be looking out for to um, try and find the, an effective narrative? So I, I I know very little about schistosomiasis. I was actually found with a schistoma in my stomach once. <laughs> post, oh. uh, I can't remember where I was, but um, uh, but yeah, um, I so. I mean, it, it seems to me that the answer of these things lies in education, and that you know is um, if you're telling stories in the way that uh, whether it's uh, collaborative or, or or not, or putting the camera in the hands of um. Uh, those who are telling their own stories there's also got to be heavy education that goes with it and obviously schistosomiasis is present in a lot of places um, where there's a lack of education and that requires yeah great greater things than than just sort of um uh using those yeah telling sort of stories so i i suppose for i i, I yeah how can we use photography to give narratives about its pre prevention i mean um in, the, in similar ways of thinking about um, who gets to tell the story and what are the key points of um, yeah, educating people. I, I, I think it's quite broad. I'd, maybe, Lara, you have a better answer. Yeah, yeah I was, I was, what I would say is, it answers this and also answers, I see another question from, from Kathy, is I think you have to ask who the audience is and what you're actually wanting them to do. So, you know, Kathy's asking about how do you get someone to do a call to action Mason's asking, how do you get people to maybe change their behavior around water? You have to know who you're speaking to. And again, that's so if you're speaking to people in a way that alienates them, it doesn't resonate with them. If you're, you know, you know, there's a concept here on very for many years of donor films, you know, and where an NGO would come in and pay a local filmmaker to make a film about AIDS or any disease or, or abuse or anything. And it, these films were so obviously donor films. They they were too heavy on the education, not enough resonance, not enough authenticity or storytelling. And so you have to understand who your audience is and ideally have 
the audience who's going to be receiving the film be represented in making the film. So exactly what you were saying. So if you're trying to get people to do something, to care, resonate with them, tell the story in a way that they that makes sense to them. And the best way to do that is to have them be part of telling that story. So it doesn't matter what I think, whether it's, you know, this tropical disease or that, at the, at the, at the end of it, um, there has to be a resonance to get people to care and to change behavior. And the only way to get that resonance is to be authentic and relevant, in, in my view. Yeah, I think that's a much better answer. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there's another interesting uh, angle from the from the leprosy, leprosy side, which is that um, the WHO has also um, um, uh, we're we're currently in a uh, a campaign that, that's uh, called the triple zeros, and it's so zero transmission, zero stigma, uh, and zero discrimination. And actually, that has been very important because, you know, uh, making that part of policy has actually meant that countries have been removing discrimination laws, you know, because there are some of these laws that, you know, have been there for a long time, you know, in, in a way, you know, that uh, probably, uh, you know, not part of people's active history. But I, I think that, again, because it was made part of policy, you know, it's been, it's been uh, that's been also helpful, I would say. Fantastic. And I, I think that's, uh, you mentioned the WHO, Diana, and that's been picked up uh, in a comment by Cameron Rafiq, my colleague at ICENTD, who says, um, who's asking, how does this approach to visual storytelling speak to the WHO advocated move um, that I mentioned earlier on as well towards country ownership um, of disease control programs um, and also specifically to Laura perhaps um, focusing on the role of women within the, the shifts that are really encouraged and enshrined in this new roadmap to control neglected diseases um, what will the role of women be in disease endemic regions in galvanizing political will to tackle these neglected issues and also releasing the all important funding needed to make this country ownership real? Yeah, I mean, I'll just briefly touch maybe on the, the women side. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, we've just been told about this po uh, policy going into the session, so I'm not, I'm not familiar with it, but I think. You find obviously in across many um, poor and uh, disadvantaged communities, women are, are at the head of the household. There's a lot of women and, and actually child centered households, but women have a massive role to play, obviously, in this because they take the burden of childcare, care of the elderly, um, care of the extended family. So I think, but what the, the, what's important is connecting those women, um, is, you know, connecting women across within communities and across communities. And so, I mean, you know, our community is a community of women filmmakers and we're, or, or who want to be in that space and we're connecting them through various ways. And I think, you know, organizations that are looking to do this need to find ways to, by connecting women, you empower women. When they realize that, that what they're experiencing is the same thing that a woman in the, another village, another village is experiencing. Mm -hmm. Then you get the collective will, which leads to, which often leads to advocacy and to then to policy change. So I really think it's again, it goes back to the, the empowerment and the connection of, and, and, and starting with women is, is always a good place. <laughs> yeah, women access all areas, don't they? Um, we're coming up to the end of our 90 minute session. I feel um, quite sad that we haven't heard from John. Uh, just by way of background, um, as I was saying, John has kind of uh, one life in the commercial photography uh, world. And through that and through his many travels, uh, John's actually really uh, embraced what we've been discussing, um, really looking through a very uh, personal and a new lens in a way, um, looking at misrepresented communities, um, such as uh, anything ranging really from albini albinized, albinism to mental health, to forgotten black histories, um, 
you know, the unsung heroes all around us in uh, society. So uh, perhaps to conclude the session, um, I could just show a very brief selection of John's photos uh, that we had ready. It's really hard to summarize John's work uh, and uh, given the huge scope and breadth of it, but hopefully we will arrange for another kind of separate session where we can hear a lot more uh, from John's uh, decades of experience, really. And so just to illustrate a little bit what we've been talking about, here's um, uh, in no particular order a selection of John's work. Um, here we go. So um, obviously we focused a little bit more on the images that are related to conditions uh, of poverty and neglected communities. Um, I was mentioning uh, John's work with um, albinism and again, uh, images taken during a trip in Rwanda. I'm sure John would have a lot of commentary to say about these. An image that many of you might recognize, so taken in Sudan, and that was uh, made headlines by illustrating one of Oxfam's campaigns looking at income inequality. 85, the eight, world's 85 richest people own the same wealth as the uh, poorest half of the world. Some images from Kenya. Also Hurricane Katrina. Taken in Sudan. And finally covering um, HIV AIDS in Thailand. And if you do want to get in touch with John, uh, please visit his website directly. And um, I'm sure we'll, as I said, we're really hoping to have John here live um, in, in a shorter separate session as soon as we can. Um, so on that note, uh, I think it's time to wrap up for today. I just wanted to thank you so much. Uh, it's really not long enough. I feel like we've only just started kind of discussing and unpacking all these issues. The road ahead is definitely very exciting as more and more content kind of floods um, our, our social media feeds and all around us as we're so um, tuned in now to the visual economy and the creative industry. So uh, we'll be watching this space and your next projects. And uh, once again, on behalf of uh, all our audience and the ICNTD, I just wanted to really thank you for your time today. Uh, it was lovely to hear from you and um, thanks for sharing all your experience and uh, your, your great advice.